Good morning, everyone. I'm Neil Pollack. I'm from Divers Alert Network and Duke University. This morning, we're going to be talking about thermal physiology and protection. Now, conflict of interest. Um, I will be talking about some commercial devices. I have no financial interests or conflicts to disclose. I do get salary from Duke and Dan. Why do we care about thermal issues? To start with, this is the big question. Why do we care? Well, number one, there's a really broad range of environments that would be open to diving. The image you can see shows a thermal range of the world's oceans. If you're limited to the tropical waters, you're really missing an awful lot of beautiful space. Once you get to the green or out to the purple or even out to the pink when you're near the polar regions, there are a lot of incredible things that happen there. If you're equipped for it, you can do very, very well. So we're going to be talking about the very practical considerations for making sure that you can have a comfortable, comfortable expansion of uh, your diving range. The most important thing for that comfort is your ability to handle a task at hand. If you've got to do work or you want to stay and do a long dive, you definitely need to be thermally stable. And finally, the reason why we should be very interested in the thermal side is the fact that thermal issues are a strong confounder of decompression stress. And so that's really where we're going to start so people understand why they should be paying attention. Okay. If you want to dive in cold regions, there are a lot of beautiful places to go. Some of the ice diving is really fantastic. The water is beautiful, visibility is clear, but you have to remember that the water temperature is almost minus 2 degrees C, or 29 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're always deciding, which gloves do I use? The ones that are a little bit warmer, or the ones that I can actually do some work in? Now, not everybody is going to be doing the very cold dives, but there are other dives that can have the same concerns in terms of thermal stress. This is a profile from a paper that Don Cronegas was first author on. This was a review of the logistics that went into the bridging of two springs. It was basically a seven mile connection. You don't want to be a little bit cool on a 20 and a half hour dive. You want to be comfortable. And so this is the other time when, when thermal issues are a consideration. Let's start by giving an example of how this can affect your decompression safety. This is really based on a study that was done at the NEDU in Panama City. Wayne Gerth is the first author on this study. What they did, they used a phase clamp temperature exposure. The two components were the descent and bottom phase, so throughout your actual bottom time, or the decompression. Now, all of these studies employed a 91-minute decompression. All of the decompression profiles were set the same so they could standardize that exposure. To give you a little bit more background, warm was classed as 36 degrees C. So that's basically body temperature, core temperature. So that is clearly pretty warm. Cold was classed as 27 degrees C. Your average skin temperature is about 32 degrees C. And if you're in 27 degrees C water for a prolonged period of time, you will get chilly. So that is actually cool water for an unprotected swimmer. And these people were unprotected. They were exercising fairly aggressively. They were exercising at about seven mets, so about seven times resting, which is about twice the number of mets you want to do for a prolonged dive. But so now let's look at the, the basic conditions. The first thing they did is looked at warm and cold. And so in this case, you're warm through the end of the bottom time, and then you're cold on the way up. Now, if you think about it, that's the reality for most divers. Most divers know they're going to get cold through the course of the dive, so they do everything they can to get warm in the beginning, short of sweating too much. So if you're in a wetsuit, you pour hot water in the gloves or down the back of your neck. If you're in a dry suit, you may use heat packs. You may use any number of things. Most divers try to go in fairly warm, thinking, well, gee, I'll get cold as I go. But that's a problem, because when you're warm in that early phase of the dive, you're increasing the uptake of inert gas. And then if you get cold during the decompression phase, you're seeing a reduction in the rate of elimination relative to what you'd see if you were warmer. And so that's probably the worst case scenario, warm, cold, maximum uptake, depressed elimination. And if you look at this, what we had, so this was a 120 foot uh, maximum depth dive, and they had a 30 minute bottom time, then they did that standard decompression. I won't mention this again because this is fixed throughout all the profiles. So what they had is seven out, of, seven out of 32 subjects got bent. Now that's a small sample size to start talking about percentages, but it's, it's convenient, so it's 22%. But it is a small sample size. But okay, clearly this is not a great combination. This 
decompression, 91 minutes, was very long, much longer than was needed by US Navy tables for that 120 foot dive for 30 minutes. And yet they still bent a lot of subjects. So what happened in the Cold War? Well, same profile, and they bent nobody out of 80 subjects. And so what we have here, we have a situation where we've got a significant difference between a diver who's going down cold and coming up warm. If you think about it, it makes sense. By being cool, when you go down, you're decreasing the peripheral circulation, you're decreasing the uptake of inert gas, you have less to get rid of at the end. By warming you up during that long 91 minute decompression phase, you're giving yourself plenty of time to be eliminating that inner gas. So that's the best case scenario. Problem is, it's the one nobody wants to do. Nobody wants to go in cold. We want to be warm now, even though it's safer to be warm later. We're not done with this study. They had zero hits at this. So you might ask yourself, well, do, am I anywhere close to the limit or do I know where the limit is? The answer is, if you have no hits, you don't know. So let me make sure that's clear. For the warm cold exposure where they bent 22% of the subjects, you can assume they're pretty close to a safe limit or even beyond a safe limit. For the cold warm, when they bent nobody, they don't know how much further they can go. So they went further. So they did another cold warm exposure. They actually did three, but I'm only talking, as I said, about two thirds of the data in the study. For comparison purposes, they did a cold warm exposure that went out to a bottom time of 70 minutes. And that 70 minute bottom time is you know, more than twice the bottom time of the earlier one, and they only bent 0.1% of the subjects, two out of 158. Those are pretty good numbers, and that shows the decompression benefit of being cold going down, warm coming up. That is pretty powerful. Now, we're still not done. The next thing you can look at, what about warm, warm? All right, I don't want to be cold. What if I'm warm and warm? Well, warm and warm does give you a significant difference. If you're warm on the way down and then warm coming up, it is about 17% hit rate. Again, very small numbers, so the percentages are a little misleading, potentially but you can see that this looks like it's not nearly as good as being cold warm. Fairly big effects. And then the last thing you could ask yourself, well, what if I go down cold and come up cold? Surely if I go down cold, I'm not taking on inert gas, so then I won't need to eliminate as much. And that's true, but you're also really going to be compromising your elimination because you're cold all the way. You'll be very cold at the end of that dive. And so when they looked at cold, cold, it came out that again, it was not different. Now this is not a true comparison because this is a 60 minute bottom time, so it didn't compare perfectly. But the point is, take home message, if you really want to improve your decompression safety, being cool on the way down and on the bottom and warm on the way up would be the best. Because it goes against what we want to do in human nature, we have to come up with compromises. You have to decide what you want to do to affect your risk. If you really want to be warm going down and warm coming up, you can do that, but realize your risk is higher. Now, a lot of people put faith in the dive computers, and you have to know there is not an algorithm out there that controls for this. A lot of people say, hey, my dive computer compensates for temperature. Well, what is it measuring? It's measuring water temperature. Water temperature has nothing to do with your thermal straps. Picture the person who's diving in tropical waters wearing a dry suit compared to the person who's going in in a swimsuit. The thermal stress is completely different in the same water temperature. You can see the subtleties in what was found in the NEDU study. There is no simple way that we have right now to capture this um, in an algorithm basis. So it's up to you to think about it and adjust your risk accordingly. Okay. Now that we've hopefully made it clear that it's important to know this stuff, what do you have to think about to adjust your own risk? Well, what are the major avenues of heat loss or heat exchange? We're mostly concerned with loss. Radiation is electromagnetic energy that's radiating from any relatively warm body to any cooler body. All you need is a physical space between the two, and you will have radiant energy flowing from something warm to something cold. It doesn't matter if it's a 6,000 degree surface of the sun going to a cooler planet Earth, or if it's a, a warm body going into a, a cooler wall. We transfer heat by radiative flow. Conduction is the heat flow between two objects in physical contact. The term that we have to introduce is that which covers the inverse of conduction, and that is insulation. The unit that is usually used or often used to talk about the quality of insulation is the CLO. It represents the thermal protection provided by a summer weight British suit in the 50s. 
Our next avenue of heat loss is evaporation. Evaporation is the heat that you expend when you're converting liquid water to the gaseous state. Everybody should remember that you don't lose heat when you sweat. You lose heat when you evaporate the sweat. And so if the sweat drips off you, it's not doing you any good at all. Evaporative heat loss is uh, something that's potentially important in the diving environment. And it is even more interesting in how it works with the rebreather world. So we'll come back to this one. And finally, convection. Heat flow through currents that you can find in any liquid or gas. Those are the four major avenues. And now let's talk about how we protect against the loss from these avenues. First off, for radiative heat flux, it's not actually that much of a concern in diving. When you have a radiative barrier that's right next to your skin, you still have a lot of heat flow through conduction. So that radiative barrier, when it's right next to your skin, isn't actually doing a heck of a lot of good. Depending on where it is in the ensemble, it can do some good, but this is not a huge area that you're either improving or is costing you. So radiative barriers probably aren't that important. What about conduction? This is the major avenue for heat loss in diving. This is the one that we have to worry about in almost all cases. And so we want to control the conductive heat loss. The way to do this is simply to increase the quality of the insulation. The best insulator is a vacuum. If we could have a vacuum, we could do very, very well. And think about the best example of an insulating suit, and that would be the EMU, the extravehicular mobility unit. And so if you're talking about a spacesuit, think of what an astronaut does during a spacewalk. If they're going from the sunny side to the dark side, they could be going through a 260 degree centigrade or 500 degree Fahrenheit temperature shift almost instantly. That's huge. And they're wearing a suit that's not really that much more bulky than a dry suit. How is it that they manage to do it? The simple reason is that they can have a near perfect vacuum layer in that suit. So why can't we do that in a dry suit? The pressure is moving that gas envelope around. You put yourself in the water, you're compressing your legs, that gas, bla uh, gas bubble is going up to the shoulders. So we don't have a uniform distribution. We don't have the ability to generate a nice, neat little vacuum layer, which would be phenomenal. When we can come up with that in a dry suit, you'll have no thermal problems at all. The key for getting a good conductive protection is persistent loft. You can have loft, and then you have loft that really stays with you. You really want the stuff that stays with you to do the job. Finally, we have evaporative losses. We have uh, two means of, of heat loss through the evaporative stream. The first is respiratory heat loss. Now, you all know as gas gets dense, more dense as you go under greater pressure, it has a higher capacity for heat, so it can hold more of your heat. So you're losing heat as you're going through greater depths. And if we look at some of the numbers here, you have a very obligatory high heat loss in open circuit systems. You're breathing a cold gas, and it's even colder than you would expect because, of course, it's being stepped down from a high pressure to an intermediate pressure, and that's causing a lot of cooling. And so you're breathing in a very cold gas. You have to warm it. Unless you want to stop breathing, you are going to have to live with the high heat loss of uh, respiratory evaporation. And I gave you some numbers here just so you can get an idea. This doesn't apply for a lot of uh, recreational diving, but if you look at deep commercial diving, you have to actively warm the gas that is being inspired or you suffer from hypothermia. And that's the only time I'm going to say hypothermia can occur commonly in diving because normally it doesn't. When you're diving deep, you have to warm that inspired gas to avoid cooling problems. And so open circuit, we suffer. When you go to the closed circuit, you have a solution. Because you've got that exothermic reaction in the CO2 scrubber, you're actually generating heat, and so you're actually getting positive thermal gain. So CCRs are definitely great in terms of controlling or actually completely eliminating evaporative heat loss from the uh, respiratory system. Finally, the second means of evaporative heat loss is through the skin. I've got it up there on the notes saying that it's unimportant. Tell me why. Why, is, why am I saying that evaporative heat loss from the skin is unimportant in the diving application? 100% relative humidity. You can't evaporate anything when you have 100% relative humidity. Within five minutes of closing the zipper of a dry suit, you've got no evaporative heat loss through the skin. So it's just not a problem. And so we don't have to worry about that. 
Finally, this one, convective, it's of varying importance. Convective heat loss, it, it varies depending on your microclimate stability. If you have a dry suit and it is a dry suit, not a damp suit, you've got no convective heat flow, you're in pretty good shape. In a wet suit, it's going to be reasonable if you've got good fit. And good fit is a tough thing. The best wetsuit fit is the one where the suit is so snug that you come up with dry spots. But it's not so, no, so snug that you cut off your superficial circulation. If you have that kind of fit, you have the best fit. Now we have to talk about cold water, because cold water is one of those things that everybody wants to talk about in diving. If you read most articles that talk about thermal stress in diving, they will start talking about hypothermia, and they'll give you the stages of hypothermia, the symptoms, how to manage it, and it is all irrelevant. Let me defend that. If you're talking about cold water immersion, it is a thermally hazardous exposure. If you have somebody who's dropping into the water unprotected, they have to deal with that really high heat capacity of the water. Air has a very low heat capacity. Even though you can dump a lot of heat to air, you don't because it doesn't hold too much. Water holds a lot of heat, so you can dump so much that effectively it will conduct away about 20 to 27 times the amount of heat energy that air will. And so that is a heat sink. It's just drawing it away. If we have somebody who's unprotected, when they go into the water, we've got four phases of the insult that we can recognize. These are significant threats. And so number one, you've got the initial immersion response, the cold shock. And this one is exhilarating. Your heart rate goes through the roof. Respiratory rate goes up. Blood pressure goes up. Your cerebral blood velocity goes down because you're actually blowing off so much CO2, which is a potent vasodilator, you actually get a, a real reduction in your cerebral blood flow. Those are marked changes that develop, and they occur more and more aggressively as the temperature falls below 15 degrees C or about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. And so that cold shock is real for an unprotected swimmer. The next thing is the thing that actually kills most people when they're immersed in cold water, and that would be swimming failure. You take someone who is, I don't care if they're an Olympic swimmer, you put them in fairly modest temperature water, perhaps 65 degrees or maybe 60 degrees Fahrenheit, they will swim from the horizontal and they will get progressively more vertical and then they will slip away. That swim failure is remarkable in its onset speed. It's really, really potent and it doesn't take that cold a temperature because the number one thing that kills people when they're immersed in cold water is um, asphyxia. They lose their airway and you lose the airway because you lose the ability to swim and protect the airway and then you're gone. If you're lucky, you have enough buoyancy say a life vest, that you can get to stage three, usually you're going to get either die before this point or you're going to be getting out. And then finally, um, the last phase you have to worry about is circumrescue collapse. Somebody who's getting fragile at the end of an immersion exposure, when they're pulled out of the water, quite often they'll go into a full physiological collapse. You do have to be gentle when you're pulling people out. Those are the kinds of things you may hear when you're talking about thermal stress in diving, but the most important thing you should realize is that none of these apply to the normal diving circumstances. Even the poorest wetsuit protects you enough that these things don't apply. And if you have a decent wetsuit, or better yet, a dry suit with reasonable undergarments, these things are just not concerns. Let's talk about that. These are data that I pulled together from three different papers. And these are of unprotected or close to unprotected swimmers. One group had a little bit more clothing than the other. But basically, they're not wearing much for clothes. And I want to walk you through what's happening with an unprotected swimmer. So what we're looking at is different water temperatures from 30 degrees down to C in the Celsius. If you want, here are your Fahrenheit numbers, so from 86 down to 32. And what we're considering is how fast is the core temperature falling? We know that normal core temperature is around 37 degrees C. So how fast is it falling? How many degrees C per hour? Well, if we have someone in 25 degrees C water, which is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit, they're at null. They're not losing core temperature. Half of the people in this condition will actually be getting warmer because of the swim, and half will be getting colder. So it's pretty much null depending on your body composition. Someone who's like me, an endomorph, when you're short and stocky, you're going to be better in the cold than someone who's an ectomorph who's tall and slender. They've got more surface area, they're going to be more of a radiator. So there are a lot of individual differences and they play a that play a role, but basically when we're talking about 77 degree water, it's, it's just unimportant. If you go down to 18 degree C water or about, oh that's about 64, um, some people are still increasing their 
their body temperature. It's about, on average, a one degree C per hour drop. Think about that in perspective. You're at 37 degrees C, you're not really worrying about a life threat as long as you have a protected airway until you're well into the 20s. It takes an awful long time before this is a problem. If we go into 10 degrees C water, yeah, average person is losing about 3 degrees C per hour. This is getting serious. In about 60 to 90 minutes, you've got a significant problem. But some people are only losing 1 degree C per hour, and some are losing 6. So high variability. And if we go cooler, when we go down to um, 5 degrees C, we have an, a loss of about 4 degrees C per hour. That's significant. And if we go to 0, then the average person is losing 6 degrees C per hour. And it can go up a lot more. So I know those are a lot of numbers. If you just get the idea of the trend, that within reasonable temperatures, even an unprotected swimmer takes a long time before they truly suffer thermally. Most of us aren't anywhere close to that experience. So this is a single case example of a diver in the Antarctic who was using a compressed neoprene suit, a DUI suit with insulate undergarments, and jumped into the water, minus two degrees C, and felt water at the crotch. This was a cross chest zipper. What happened, it had delaminated. So there was a flush of water into the crotch. And what we have, a starting core temperature of about 36.1 degrees, the dive was finally ended at 43 minutes because the diver could not figure out how to adjust the camera. So at that point, okay, clearly not thinking well, time to get out of here. So a 43 minute dive, the water level in the suit, it was about mid chest anteriorly and it was mid small of the back posteriorly. So there was a substantial volume. So you get to the surface and it's five miles skidoo ride back to the hut. And so you have to get on the skidoo, you ride in there, the first thing you do when you get to the hut, the heat's cranked up, you pull off the suit. Well, at that point, the core temperature was only 35.8. It only fell 0.3 degrees C. What's interesting is that this is where the suit came off. That was the first measure. And then by the next measure, it dropped 1.3 degrees. This is temperature after drop. And this is what you commonly see. When you're in the moment, you actually don't get too cold. And the reason why is very simple. When your skin is cold, it stimulates the shivering response. And shivering can increase your basal metabolic rate about five-fold. You can generate a tremendous amount of heat endogenously by shivering. And so shivering is good. What happens here is you get out of that suit, you get your skin dried off, and you stand in front of the heater. Your cutaneous receptors say, OK, problem solved. I can stop shivering. And so you stop shivering, the endogenous heat production goes down, and you get a big drop. And so when you're treating somebody with hypothermia um, or cold stress, what's the, what's the first thing everybody thinks to do? You, you have a warm building, somebody is pulled out of the water. First thing you're going to do is what? Pull off their clothes, get them dry, and then what do you do? Wrap them in a blanket. Right. Why? To keep what the heat they have in them. No, that would not be true. They have been immersed in minus two degrees C water. This person is, or whatever temperature water, this person is cold. You're not putting the blanket around to keep them warm because you've moved them into a warm room. In that warm room, they will get warmer if they don't put a blanket on. The reason you should put the blanket on is to keep their skin cold. Because if you keep their skin cold, they shiver, they keep shivering. And endogenous heat production is the best heat production you have. Okay. So after drop is an important phenomenon. If you had someone who was close to a thermal stress point, after drop could take them over to the edge. But really, for most of the exposures in diving, think of that last case. It was such a trivial change until that person was well and truly out of the situation. It wasn't a life threat. But realize that after drop can be a hazard. And the reasons it happens, and I've got these prioritized in what I think are the most important ranking. Attenuated shivering thermogenesis is the biggest reason why you have after drop. You're not shivering, you're not producing the heat, so that's costing you. Number two, you have conductive heat loss along the thermal gradients. So the outside is cold, you have heat flow through the body, and that causes cooling. And then the least important is the one that a lot of people write about as the most important, and that is this idea of convective cooling because you have return in blood flow. When you are cold stressed, you are prolonging the risk window for decompression stress. In the deepest phase of the dive, when you're nice and warm, which again, everybody wants to be, you're getting maximal loading. Then towards the end of the dive, when you're cold, you, you vasoconstrict. So you're keeping that close to saturated tissue with lots of nitrogen. 
when you end the dive and you're cold, that loaded tissue stays loaded longer. There's actually a nice paper put out in 89 by Mekovic and Kakatsuba. They were doing a decompression study at Simon Fraser University, and they have a four-hour Benz watch. After the Benz watch, they were going to go up for beer. They all jumped in the showers, and three out of four of them developed skin bends. So it prolongs the risk window because you're not eliminating that gas. Okay, if you get someone who's cold, realize that hypothermia doesn't even begin until you get down to 35 degrees C. And we've already talked about how you can rewarm people. Blankets work just fine. And if you have more extreme needs, you can go through it. This is the kind of case report you might see, though. So a 34-year-old male reported numbness and paresthesia in his left hand post-dive. He did a dive to 90 feet for 90-minute total run time, 6 degrees C water, 43 degrees Fahrenheit if you prefer. He had a dry suit, a wrist computer, and trimix. So these symptoms were waxing and waning. The big question, is it DCS? 90 feet for 90 minutes. One of the big things you have to remember in that summary profile information, he could have popped down to 90 feet for two minutes and then spent the rest of the time up at 30 feet. That's why we need computerized profiles. It doesn't do us any good just to know your max depth and your time. But here's the interesting part. When you wear a dry suit and you put a gauge on your wrist before you dive, what do you do with it? You reef it down because you know the thing is going to roll around as the suit compresses. We have someone who's creating a constriction on the left wrist, the one with symptoms. This was a non-freezing cold injury. There are thermal issues that can occur in the diving world, but hypothermia is really not anywhere close to the top of the list. What do we have for thermal protection? We've got passive and active systems. And for the wetsuits, we know that standard foam neoprene is sensitive to pressure. You're going deeper, passing through thermoclines into colder water, and what's happening to the suit? It's getting less effective. At one atmosphere, you go down to four atmospheres, you can be losing two-thirds of the insulation value of that neoprene. And what's interesting, a lot of people are surprised by this, that neoprene is, is half the insulation value of air. You think, well, how can air be better than neoprene? Easy. Neoprene holds more heat capacity, so your conductive losses are much greater. Air, if you could have a nice air bladder there, doesn't hold as much heat, so your heat flux is, is actually moderate. There are a lot of things you have to think about. It's, it's a neat set of relationships. Okay, how can we improve this? Well, some manufacturers have tried to develop neoprenes that are less sensitive to pressure changes, and that can work. Pinnacle had their elastoprene that theoretically was more stable. I will tell you right now, it's hard to get data on how the new suits perform. So many come out and it's, it's hard to get data. So I don't have a lot of hard numbers for you. But there are some products out there that, that people consider. And this is, this is one of the aspects that is a concern. If you compress, you lose efficiency of that material. So it'd be nice if we had something that didn't compress quite as much. OK, dry suits. We know that dry suits rely on that layering technique. We've got the base layer, the mid layer, and the shell. The base layer is usually something like polypropylene. What does that do? What's the purpose of a base layer when you're going out into the woods? It wicks water away from the skin. It stops your ability to evaporate. By moving the water far enough away from the skin, even though you've got a heat engine on the skin that would evaporate that liquid, it's so far away, it's not quite enough to evaporate it. And so what you're doing is you're removing the liquid from the heat engine so there's no evaporation or reduced evaporation. OK, is that what happens in a dry suit as well? We already talked about it. What's the relative humidity in a dry suit? 100%. How much evaporation is there? Nada. So why do we do it? Because if you were a wicking layer that has, it's hydrophobic, it holds very little water volume, you have less conductive flow into that water volume. And so that's why you wear the wicking layer. It's for comfort. It has nothing to do with evaporation. Dry suits are also, if you're talking about the standard foam neoprene suit, it's also compressible. Shell suits, like the trilaminate or nylon, any number of shell suits, they're thermally stable because there's nothing to compress, but they also don't provide a lot of protection. Point two clo, that's less than that British summer weight suit. Okay, shell suits are thermally stable, but they're not giving you much in the way of protection. Now, another alternative is to go to crushed neoprene. It's produced under greater pressure, and so basically within the diving range, it's not suffering the compression of a normal foam neoprene suit, so it's fairly thermally stable. It also provides you about 0.6 clo in protection. So it's warmer than a shell suit, it's thermally stable, and when you add the undergarments under that, you do pretty well. Undergarments are key because the suit itself, while it gives you some protection, it's not perfect. 
What about the undergarments? There are numerous options, and we're not going to have the time to talk about them too much here, but the major variability is in the preservation of loft that I talked about before, and that is the take-home message. A lot of people were really excited about weasel wear. This uh, diver right here is actually clearing ice holes in the Antarctic wearing his weasel wear. On land, weasel wear is really good because it's such a high loft garment. It's great, but we already talked about it. When you put that dry suit in the water, what happens to the air envelope? It gets pushed up to the top. What happens to the weasel wear? It gets crushed. So weasel wear, and I'm not trying to pick on weasel wear. I, I, I'm using it as an example. But the, the undergarments that are very compressible are not giving you the same protection as something that would have a protected loft. Now let's look at some of the other materials that are out there, newer materials on the market, something like the halo system by Fourth Element. This is really kind of interesting. If you look at it, it's got pads. And if you push sideways, they will collapse. But if you have a direct pressure on them, they will tend to stay upright. What those pads are doing is preserving that dead airspace rather than something like the weasel wear that is just compressing down to nothing. There are some other dry suits, and again, out of the UK is one of the more interesting ones. They have an under layer, that, and it makes a, a fixed airspace barrier because it's a very open waffle. It allows some fixed trapping of gas, which gives you pretty good insulation. So there are some strategies that take advantage of what we really understand or should understand about the thermal stress. Okay, Aerogel is another product that's coming out. So this is a new one, it's worth talking about. It's actually an old product. It was developed in the 30s for the aviation industry. It's incredibly light. 99.5% air, so it's rigid, it holds a nice airspace. It was an insulator, it's great. The problem is, you have to make this stiff material with a clothing garment to make it work. The bat is fit with another undergarment, and what you can see in terms of protection, if we think about a th six millimeter thick suit, a wetsuit may give you about 0.75 clo, Finsulate may give you 1.25 clo, Aerogel could give you 2.8 clo. So it has the potential to be incredibly valuable. And we're going to come back to Aerogel, but just before we do, I want to add one last picture to the mix, and that is dry suit inflation gas. Everybody in this community is familiar with the people who use argon, argon pardon me, as an inflation gas. It has a lower thermal conductivity, and so it should theoretically improve insulation. Well, Risberg and Hope did a study, double-blind study, where they had people diving, and the researchers didn't know, the workers, the divers didn't know, and what they found is that using argon in the suit, it made no difference on skin temperature, core temperature, or perceived comfort. So after this came out, Lou Knuckles, who was the guy who originally proposed the, that it could give you about a 48% increase in thermal insulation, he went back to the lab with a mannequin, and what they found with argon, you could get a 16 to 20% improvement in your thermal protection which depending on your diving, that may or may not be significant. But there are a couple of kickers. The biggest one is that they had to flush and fill the suit at least six times to purge everything to get it ready. Trouble is, argon is so expensive, guys want to carry the argon bottle, but when they go to open it, they're just, that's it, I'm full. No, you know, that's not working. They had to flush and purge and fill at least six times to get the benefit. So that's one. And I'm going to say right now that the cost versus benefit question remains open, and now let me show you why. And we're putting together now the air gel in this. So this is a, a, the mannequin study that Lou put together. And um, so what do you have? This showed the 20% increase in insulation using argon versus air as a field glass, and this is with a commercial dry suit. And so the take home message, we can look at legs, arms, torso, or this is the total body minus head, hands, and feet. So basically the majority of the body. And what we're seeing is we can get about a 20% improvement in the insulation. So here's your clo value. We're going from about 0.93 to 1.12 clo. So you think, okay, great, 20% improvement. Well, okay, that's using the commercial undergarment. If we go to Aerogel, we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing a 16% improvement. So you might say, okay, you know, if I'm doing a 24-hour dive, it's worth it to me if I can get a 10 or 15% improvement. And that's all well and good, but what's happening is people are missing some of the important stuff for the weeds. That 16 to 20% improvement, let's think about if you just changed from the standard undergarment to something like a new aerogel undergarment that would be more efficient. What you're looking at here is comparing a commercial suit with an aerogel suit, we're getting a 149% improvement in the insulation. 
an undergarment would be a much better way to go. And so this is if you're using the, uh, this is a trilaminate suit and it's using air. I've got another figure that shows argon inflation with a tri trilaminate suit. And basically 140% improvement in the insulation. And so for the people who want to debate back and forth whether or not argon is useful, I won't argue, but there are other strategies that actually will give you much more bang for your buck and you're not going to have to refill it all the time. Okay, in suit electric heating. There are some systems out there that work. They're battery operated, operated. They're reasonably safe. I have a problem with the human nature of it. And that is that it has the potential for creating that hazard we talked about in the beginning of being warm cold. And I'll tell you why. The battery life only goes for so long. If you start it up in the early in the dive and then it dies towards the end, you just created the worst case scenario, warm cold. Now, if you have the ability to go for the delayed gratification program, you're good. You can start cool, and then at the end of your bottom phase, you can crank it up for your decompression. If you can do that, these systems can work adequately. But they have the ability for our human nature to get us in trouble. And OK, hot water suits, primarily limited to commercial operations. And you all know what a hot water suit is, so I don't have to explain that. But the interesting thing here is this gives us the same kind of hazard that we talked about before. You can increase the risk of DCS because you are warming the body early on. You're maximizing the absorption of uh, uptake of inert gas, pardon me. And then during the decompression phase, you may not be doing enough to help. So there was a great paper published in 86 by Shields and Lee, a report of North Sea diving. And they had far and away huge increases in DCS in the hot water suit divers. There's another problem, and that is undetected hypothermia. Remember we talked about it before. The way you know you're cold is your skin is cold. We're not designed, our bodies haven't caught up to our technology yet. So when the skin is warm, our brains say, you're warm. And so when you clamp the skin temperature warm, you don't shiver. You are insensitive to respiratory heat loss. And if it's a deep dive, you can cool, you can get what's called undetected hypothermia. And it was measured in a couple studies. If you have core temperature drop no more than about 0.7 degrees C per hour, you will not be aware of it while your temperature is dropping. So interesting possibility there. So what do we know in summary here? Well, first, there are just a, a couple things I want to take home. Thermal stress is set by the protection, not the water temperature. So we really have to get a, away from this idea of just because a computer knows what the temperature of the water is, it knows anything about my experience. And I believe it's a disservice to the community to let people labor under that false impression. There are no algorithms that compute thermal stress. And I know there'll be somebody who says, oh, ours does this. Well, guess what? It's a soft adjustment that arbitrarily makes a change. It's not monitoring your condition. There's not a computer out there that does it. And then number two, thermal stress can influence diving safety, primarily decompression related. Hypothermia is not a problem. Your first concern is the effect on your decompression safety. The second concern is a localized circulatory disruption, particularly with a dry suit when you've got those constricting wrist seals. And then the far distant third is hypothermia. Okay, thanks. Aerogel become commercially available? Well, aerogel suits, they're, they put a lot of money into suits. Right now, the test suits are, I think last I heard, they were two or three grand a piece. But it's going to come on the market probably um, within a number of months. Whether that's less than 12, I don't know. But it'll be out there very, very soon. First iteration will be pretty expensive, but it has the potential to be pretty neat. I've got a question. Your Antarctic diver, when did the core temperature come back to the 36 degrees? The core temperature on that profile, it actually didn't come up until the next day. It was, uh, there was a prolonged depression of that core temperature after that uh, immersion under the ice. Your, uh, the, the cold water scenario in terms of the base of the dive profile, is it not so much to have to choose? Is it to have to have to have Well, yes, you can. You can exercise lightly on decompression. But that's what you want. Aggressive exercise would be counterproductive. You can do isometrics. You can do light swimming and a slightly negative um, buoyancy. What you should do is keep your workload as low as possible during the bottom phase.